are um, there are three for working in three different kinds of bases. The one that you're probably most likely to pick up almost immediately, and this is because you're most familiar with it, are decimal integers. And uh, those are in base 10. They're the kinds of numbers that we work with every day. So those, of course, contain digits 0 through 9. And there are also octal literals that start with a 0 character. And then they uh, have characters um, 0 through 7. And what these are used for is um, largely um, if you're working on an operating system like Unix, then um, some of the things like the file system permission specifications uh, sometimes use this format. Um, it's otherwise uh, m it otherwise may not be as useful, um, but nonetheless, um, it's something that was inherited by C, which um, was um, was uh, something that was actually written to assist Unix, so that's part of the reason why it's in there. And um, then there's uh, the hexadecimal literals, and these are actually pretty useful. Um, some numbers are a whole lot easier to represent in hexadecimal in certain cases. And so these are a little bit like your decimal uh, literals, except you prefix them with the character 0x, and then in addition to 0 and 9, you've also got um, uh, these digits A and F that represent the other uh, remaining hexadecimal digits. And so, depending on context, these can be suffixed by uh, the characters S, L, U, or even a combination of these. Now, we also have um, floating point literals, and these are your real numbers. And these are decimal only, um, so they consist of uh, 0 through 9, and then you can also stick a period anywhere, um, anywhere there. And so, for instance, 10.5 is, um, is a uh, example of a floating point literal. And then, um, if you need kind of something similar to a, um, form a scientific notation, then uh, what you do is you uh, add an e to the end and the power of 10 that you want. So uh, 2.5 e3, for instance, is 2.5 times 10 to the uh, third power. And you can also uh, optionally suffix this by, uh, by f, and we'll see um, We'll see in a bit where that would be useful. And there are other kinds of literals as well. There are Boolean literals, which represent either true or false. There are character literals, which um, you surround in single quotes. And then there are string literals, which are uh, runs of characters, and you surround those in double quotes. And uh, a really nifty thing you can do with string literals is you can actually take two of them, and if they're side by side, they'll uh, be automatically concatenated together, as seen uh, here. So uh, then we have identifiers, and identifiers are um, basically anything that starts with a letter or an underscore, and uh, they consist of. Uh, anything beyond that considering a letter, a digit, or an underscore. And so, um, of course, um, for reasons that the, uh, the way that tokenization works, you can't have any spaces. Um, usually the underscore serves its purpose instead. And then um, it also, um, your identifier also can't be a reserved word. And uh, just another thing that I don't have listed here, um, the C++ language actually uh, specifies that anything starting with two underscores is considered to be a reserved identifier by the, um, by the compiler itself. Although usually the compiler doesn't uh, check for this. It's just a convention. So, um, there are also reserved words in C++, and in the 1998 specification of C++, there are 68 
uh, we'll learn more about these as um, there arises a need for each specific reserved word. Um, so we'll just leave it at that for now. And uh, there are also operators, and operators um, have a precedence which is kind of like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, if you remember that from your earlier math classes that you may have taken in middle school. And then there's also uh, associativity. Operators in C++ actually don't follow the associativity rule. They um, instead have something called left or right associativity. And um, this basically determines the order in which the operands are processed. And so the majority of um, operators in C++ are left associative. Um, there are a few, like, for instance, uh, this bang operator here that um, have right associativity, and there are some that it depends on context um, what their associativity would be. And as we start looking at some of the lower precedence um, operators, we begin to see some that we might be familiar with. For instance, um, multiply and divide and addition and subtraction are operators we all know. And then we may also be familiar with the relational operators as well. Uh, one thing that does um, bear um, worthiness of being mentioned is that equality and assignment are two different things in, um, in C++. So, when you assign something, you're basically saying, this is the value. And when you're checking for equality, you're saying, are these the same? And so that uh, that's worth mentioning. And um, there are also some shorthand operators as well that uh, tend to be um, the assignment operator combined with uh, some of our uh, arithmetic operators. And so, for instance, if you have a plus equals b, then that essentially means a equals a plus b, or a assign a plus b. And um, we also have some reserved words that correspond to the uh, actual, some of the actual operators themselves, and those are listed here as well. So um, now we've got this parsing phase, and um, the parsing phase is the phase where the compiler tries to interpret your code. So um, remember we talked about programs uh, being a collection of data, and um, in some languages there's only one type of data, in C++ you can actually have several. And uh, there are two basic categorizations for um, uh, data types. We have primitive types, which are built into the compiler. And then we have composite types, which are made up of primitive types, and then perhaps other composite types. And some uh, other languages, Java being a good one, uh, a good example of this, will uh, actually have some um, details about the primitive types that, um, like, maybe their size or their implementation that are standardized, and C++ doesn't actually go as far as to standardize that. Your compiler might actually have definitions for these, but it's not in the standard, and that's because most programs don't require this. And there are facilities for actually getting specific forms of uh, this um, of these primitive types if you need them. So uh, what primitive types do we have? Well, we have a great many. Um, you can see here that we have uh, four integer types and also three floating point types and a special boolean type. So um, basically the deal here is that if you take any one of these categories um, there is um, a restriction on precision to where um, a type in that category must be um, at least as precise as the type before, and it's usually more precise. So, for instance, um, uh, short has to be as le uh, at least as precise as care, and int has to be at least as precise as short. 
Um, so you have this still here to where um, we have um, different suffixes on the types to where um, this is what, for instance, on the integer literal, what S and L would mean. And so uh, you could specify a short literal by appending S to it and so forth. And um, you also have various floating point types um, as well. And, um, and the, the Boolean type, which is technically an integer. So uh, just some special notes about this. Um, we, um, for instance, we have um, care is most likely being the same as a byte and usually being the minimum um, unit of data that you can have. And int is usually um, the um, size of an integer that the machine is um, most comfortable working with, uh, which is usually what's called a machine word. Um, Float and double um, are usually of different precision, and long double you usually only use in scientific computing. So um, now we also have for integers this quality of signedness, and signedness is this quality of an integer that determines whether or not you can store negative values in the integer. And the reason for this is because you don't always need negative integers, and they cost you half your range um, in most implementations. So um, if you want an unsigned um, integer type, then you can use the unsigned keyword to um, qualify that type as unsigned. And um, likewise, we have the signed keyword for the same purpose. Of except for specifying signed integers instead. And so what you would do is you would precede the type by its signedness specification. Um, and you could say signed short, for instance, um, and have a signed short integer. And that's usually also the default um, signedness of a short. Um, or you could say unsigned short, and then it would be unsigned. And if you don't specify the type afterwards, then it's implied to be int. So unsigned count would refer to um, an unsigned int count. And note that this only works for primitive types, and also that the care type um, via the standard actually doesn't specify its signedness. So, um, if you depend on that functionality, then uh, you need to explicitly specify it. And each translation unit uh, consists of zero or more um, actual statements. And so, um, in this case, um, we have um, a number of different statements that we could use. The two that you're probably going to use most commonly are expression statements and declaration statements. But there are others as well that will come into play um, throughout um, our various dealings with the code. And um, there are also symbols. And symbols um, are basically uh, things that have been given an item, or uh, rather an identifier. And um, these symbols, um, in order to use them, you have to declare them, but um, uh, you don't always have to define them. Um, you should, usually, but the compiler doesn't um, require that. Something called the linker probably will. And um, basically, the deal is, is that the declaration basically says hey, this symbol exists, and definition actually assigns a value to the symbol. And so it makes sense that you can only define a symbol once in a translation unit, and um, that you could declare a symbol multiple times.